This is what I collected the other day on a stretch of a few meters on a beach in Stockholm. It's so messy and dirty, so I don't want to show you this. But I also collected, of course, one broken bottle of soft drink of a famous trademark. Someone had been drinking coffee and didn't want to take the cup home. Someone, for some reason or other, have, do you recognize this? You can fetch it afterwards. Uh, a small pencil. These things, tops. Some plastic lids. Plastic. And of course, styrofoam, which breaks down into small white bubbles that birds and fishes believe are edible. And they end up in birds far out in the Pacific Ocean in the middle of nowhere, and they even kill the birds. Don't blame the plastic, blame the use of plastic. We should find new pathways for plastics together with Rainier Hati Kaul. Please welcome up on the stage and uh, say how can we... Thank you. <laughs> how, how can engineers create a better world than this? Go yeah, ahead. but thank you for a very visible uh, demonstration. I <laughs> no, thank you. Okay, I'll leave the floor. Yeah, uh, to start with, I would also like to thank uh, uh, the, for the possibility of being here for this important event of EVA. I'm really enjoying it since yesterday. And uh, before I start to talk about plastics, I must confess I'm not a plastic expert. And uh, uh, my relationship to plastics is like any one of yours. I use them a lot. If you just look around you, where you are sitting, you will see how much plastics is around you. And, uh, but since some years, I have been reminded, I'm being reminded constantly, like uh, Ulf just uh, did, that plastics are a problem. And, uh, and, and if you look at, uh, I mean, we see images of plastics on television or we hear about it almost every day. And when you hear about and read about uh, such news about that a diver who made, uh, uh, who went down almost 11 kilometers down to the ocean bed from the surface and finds a plastic bag. And uh, there you, s and you see these images of, uh, of sea animals, of sharks and turtles and all eating the plastic several kilos of them which are destroying their organs, they're entangled in plastic. It is indeed distressing, isn't it? And uh, so, but the question is, perhaps we should ask ourselves, how did we get here? And so if we look back a little more than 100 years and what, where the problem has arisen, uh, but it was not the, not the problem initially, it was actually an invention of this fantastic material. And uh, if, uh, it was as, uh, as long back as 1909 that the first synthetic plastic, which was called bakelite, was invented by a Belgian. And this was a material for thousand uses, it was called. And if you're as old as me, you would remember using the telephones made of, of this material. And after this invention came several many developments of different plastics over the years, many out of curiosity and some out of the need, for instance, uh, the nylon that was made to replace the pure silk that was being used by the women for, for their stockings. And then you had the discovery of the synthetic rubber uh, by the Americans, which had uh, funded in a lot of money during World War II for, for, the, uh, for, for the military trucks and also the army uh, weaponry that they needed. Uh, but if you look at these numbers from 1950 to, to the present day, the plastic volumes, the global plastic volume, has gone up from 1.5 million tons to 335 million tons of plastics. That is where the problem is. And the, the, uh, in fact, the increase in this volume is actually because of the increase in demand, because of the functions, functions they fulfill uh, for, uh, for us. But if we continue business as usual, we are going to end up even more more than 1,000 million tons of plastics. Okay, so plastics have been actually helping us in saving resources. They are, uh, in fact, saving lives for us. 
in terms of improving food, food shelf life. They uh, save energy uh, in transportation, constructions. They have high material efficiency and lower emissions. And also maintaining uh, safety and uh, sterility in the hospitals. In fact, some of our organs also are uh, plastics whenever we, when we need them. Okay, so the plastics are, are good materials. And uh, so when we, uh, but when we see the plastics out in the nature, this is what we see today. And the millions of tons of more post-consumer plastic waste that's out in the nature, on land and in oceans, we hear of mi microplastics in the environment. And uh, so there exists no efficient recycling system for plastics. There does exist some recycling in some countries, but not in the whole world. And much of the plastic is incinerated or goes for landfilling. And that means besides the uh, burden on the environment that we are creating, there is also an enormous loss in material value. It is in billions of dollars that we lose the, uh, lo uh, lose the money. But besides, besides this problem, the environmental degradation problem, we need also to look at the feedstock that we are making the plastics from, and which is actually a very small fraction of the total fossil feedstock that we are using today, about six to eight percent in terms of the material as well as the energy for production, but it does amount to a lot of carbon dioxide emission, emissions annually. So, what are the, how do we make transition to a more sustainable plastic system? Now, there are a number of organizations like Ellen MacArthur, World Economic Forum, then you have EU Plastic Strategy. Many countries have their own, uh, own uh, strategies like Sweden, Denmark, Finland, everybody has strategies. Countries in Africa and Asia are trying to minimize the use of plastics but replace it with something else. But what we really need to understand is what is really sustainable. Uh, are we replacing plastics with something else and creating other problems? Plastics is a good material, and uh, how can we reap the benefits of this without impacting the environment? And that is something what we engineers need to think. So what is really sustainable? Where do we want to be in 100 years? And uh, so, if we, uh, engineering is going to have a very important role in the new plastics economy in the coming, deta uh, in the coming de decades, and that is inevitable. And one of the important things that one needs to do is the design the material for recycling and reuse. We hear a lot about the need for recycling, but there is not enough recycling infrastructure, even in the developed world. But also, whatever recycling that is available, the, the materials that we have today, they are in fact optimized for their use as materials in different applications, but not for the end of life. How do we take care of the plastics later? And so these materials have to be designed uh, for increased recycling so that we can increase the resource efficiency, we can increase the material value recovery, and also reduce consumption and waste. And it is said that if we move from disposable to durable plastics, we can, such as the water bottles, we can actually reduce the volumes of plastics by as much as 60%, and that is a lot. So, what do I mean by design the, uh, uh, the, the plastic material? It is really all about chemistry. And uh, uh, so, the, the system that we have available today mostly is mechanical recycling, where the plastic is uh, uh, collected, washed, and uh, ground, and then built back again into, into the new plastic. And as I said, it's only a few plastics that are able to go through this process, but in a very limited number of cycles. So we need to design better materials, better building blocks for plastics that can make the plastic material so that you can recycle and reuse that several times. And then the word that we, the term that we hear today a lot is chemical recycling. What is chemical recycling? And here you have the polymer 
that is, which is uh, an important ingredient of plastic, which can be broken down into its monomer components and which are under certain conditions and which can then be rebuilt again into the same polymer and if not the same polymer into uh, an alternative product could be another value added polymer itself. But the trick is to design these polymers that you can, they can be selectively depolymerized under mild conditions. And I'm not talking about pyrolysis, which is the, which is the, uh, the technique that one is, uh, one is talking about today. So there is a lot of work to be done in developing the polymers and the technologies for developing these polymers in the future. Well, the other challenge is uh, to decouple plastic production from fossil feedstock. Actually, currently it's only, uh, as I said, about six to eight percent of the fossil is, uh, is uh, fossil, uh, of, of the fossil is used for, for uh, the plastics, but it does contribute to a gro uh, global uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also has an impact on climate change. So, uh, I mean, this is something that is nothing new. We have been talking about, or we have uh, also in place some uh, renewable energy systems, renewable chemicals, and the same goes for the materials. But one of the, one of the feedstocks that is used a lot is the biomass. And then the question comes, are we using the right kind of biomass? I mean, most of the biomass that is used today is the primary agricultural feedstock, which we, learned, which we heard yesterday uh, also about. It is quite water intensive. It is also fossil intensive if we think of, the, of the, uh, the fertilizers and other chemicals that we are using in its production. Now, what about the residues, the wastes that we are generating uh, uh, from our everyday use? Can we use them as uh, uh, can we use them as the feedstock? Sweden is very good in forestry, and they are trying to. We are trying here to use the uh, the forestry residues, as, uh, like uh, sawdust, etc., as the feedstock for energy and other, other materials. I have here, uh, I come from the south of Sweden, so I have actually here a wheat uh, straw ball, which is very common, commonly seen in, the, in that environment. Uh, so, uh, so the technology is already there, or it is being developed, but, so, uh, but we cannot use the same technology that we have been using for, for use for converting the fossils to the to the materials, so there has to be a shift in technology base. And uh, so if we look at the, the biomass as the feedstock, the, in a way the first plastics that were ever made in this world came from uh, the natural polymers like cellulose and proteins. Ford made the whole, made the whole uh, uh, car from soybean uh, proteins and other polymers that he got. But, and today also the more recent innovations, actually we are talking in the same lines. We are using cellulose, lignin, protein, and lately even fungus as a part of the material. So, but we are more technologically advanced today. We know the problems today. So I think uh, so perhaps there will be more uh, better solutions uh, today, but still, what we have to remember is that we are still competing with the fossil plastics which cost dirt cheap. And that is a challenge that we will be facing over the coming decades also. Now, uh, talking about the technology, it's one of the technologies that has been around now for a couple of decades is industrial biotechnology. And this is, I, I think, is going to be the mainstream technology in the future. And this is based on the use of microorganisms and their enzymes, which can transform a variety of renewable feedstocks into the chemicals, materials, and fuels that we want. And the bottom line here is the enormous diversity of microorganisms and the reactions that they have, uh, the multitude of reactions that they have, they use for 
using the chemicals or the, the feedstock that is present in their environment to survive. Now, as we heard from, uh, from Otto Carr yesterday, that we have to make friends with the microorganisms, and indeed, uh, these are really going to be the future factories uh, in, the in the 21st century. Uh, Carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, will, uh, will be, I think, one of the important feedstocks of, uh, of the future for material and for uh, fuels as well. And we know already from plants and algae, which are photosynthesizing organisms, that they reduce carbon dioxide to uh, to make uh, sugars and other products, but you do have also organisms which do not photosynthesize, but they can be provided with the reducing elements by the renewable energy from wind, from solar power, etc., to make the chemicals and, uh, and other products. And what it requires, there is already a proof of concept that this is possible, but it does require intensification of the technology uh, in this to make it scalable. Now, talking, now, why do I say so much about biotechnology? Well, this is actually the future. So let's look back again a little bit. And uh, so if we look at, if we go back to 1950s, when it was established that the genes are encoded in the long pieces of DNA and that, the, that, the, that there exists a genetic code which leads to the formation of proteins and then eventually other products. And then in the 1970s came a time when the scientists could cut, cut the pieces of genes from one organism and transfer it into another organism to produce the products of the gene. And that was actually a foundation of the biotechnology industry. And that's when many of these biopharmaceuticals and all started to be made. And, but in later, a decade later, came a time when the machine started to be developed that could synthesize the DNA. And that means that you could encode whatever chemical message you want on these pieces of DNA for production. So that means you are not really dependent on the, on the life microorganisms to go ahead and make the products. And so with these capabilities, now today we are in the era of metabolic engineering and synthetic biology. And in metabolic engineering, what we are doing is adapting or putting the different genes together in, a part in one organism, which making it to utilize whatever substrate we want. We can also uh, put genes for making whatever product we want and also delete the pathways that we want, which we think are taking away the carbon to other, other products. So this is something, uh, something which is really changing the face of production of, uh, of materials today. Day. And the technologies that are, we are ma making possible today, like omics, you may have heard about these uh, omics technologies, which really helped to, uh, to quantitate, analyze, and integrate knowledge about the different biological molecules uh, that we have, and to help understand the, the functioning of the living organisms, it's already having an impact in designing the, uh, in designing the production systems. And that is uh, also a basis of synthetic biologies, biology. So with all these capabilities, we can reprogram a living microorganism, actually a living organism, to uh, make the product of choice or to have function of choice that we want. And so this biology, biological cells like computing have a digital, are based on a digital code. And uh, so when we are no longer, we, then if we are using the DNAs produced by machines, we can actually engineering, engineer the cells same, in the same way as circuits and software. And then with the, 
with machine learning, we can, uh, we, that enables us to do genome engineering, we can do protein, uh, protein design, and with uh, more automation, automated systems and robotics, we can increase the high throughput of production. So this is going to change the paradigm of manufacture in, in the coming century, and the possibilities are enormous. Um, uh, same way, in a part of synthetic biology is also, uh, uh, it's, it has, you have the possibility to design the enzymes to catalyze the reactions that, are not, that have not been possible in the nature. And one of the Nobel Prizes that was awarded in 2018 was actually in recognition of this field. So if you have, if you can design the enzymes produced by microorganisms to degrade the plastics in a controlled way, completely to its monomers, that would be a very good a recycling, uh, recycling device, so to say. Uh, going away from uh, synthetic biology, we have been hearing a lot about digitization and automation, and I think you will hear more about it later today, and that will also impact the, uh, the plastic manufacture. Now, and today, already, the plastic proce proce uh, processors are looking for equipment that will tell them everything about the performance of their machines right onto their mobile phones or, or their computers. There will be smart alerts using sensors so as to increase, uh, increase the reliability of the, of the manufacturer to reduce the, the loss time of manufacture. There will be process control technologies. And I think the 3D printing will also become a mainstream technology in the future if, if it is not already there. And, and then you will also have machines communicating with each other so that if one stops to work, the other can take up, etc. And um, again, there will be, of course, uh, the digital connectivity across the supply chain, across the whole value chain, from, uh, from sourcing to manufacture to recycling in order to increase the transparency and traceability, and even to predict demand and uh, personalize, personalize manufacturing. And uh, then uh, uh, this uh, technology will also be affecting the sorting of plastics, and there are some examples, some prototype examples which are already available, but we should see hopefully more of that. And uh, again, uh, since we cannot, since the material flow is, we cannot afford to have them in a linear way, we cannot uh, take materials to the dump anymore, we have to think of a circular model and obviously new business models which will be affecting it. And these are, for instance, collecting and giving new life to the material and renting out these molecules rather than selling the molecules and providing product services. For instance, a person may not, a consumer may not be owning the product himself, but will be used, paying for the services of the product. And then you also have the modularity model, and that is the design of the plastics that the components of the products will be exchangeable so that you're not really throwing away the device as uh, soon after its use. Uh, so in a nutshell, the plastic uh, future, the, the engineering in, for, in the plastic manufacture, plastic design, and uh, even whole uh, plastic engineering system will be about increase in sustainability, increase in resource efficiency, reducing waste and emissions. And uh, uh, in contrast to the past century, one of the great transformations that was due to the exploitation of the fossil resources, which enabled an extensive economic development, but at the cost of the biological productivity from millions of years back, which, is stored, which was stored as coal and oil, and now the carbon is available now in, in the form of greenhouse, gas, um, greenhouse gases, I think the 21st century, in the, 20, the bio engineering of biology will be an important shift in the, uh, shift in the, in the manufacturing uh, technology. And I hope this time we will have it, uh, more foresight in how we are using these technologies and how carefully we make use of them to make, 
to make a better world. And uh, so now today our children are already demanding uh, from us that uh, let's not be complacent and uh, we need to take action against the climate change. And then there are uh, developing nations where the Western world has been dumping a lot of waste, including the plastic waste, and they are standing up and saying no more. So we do not have a choice here uh, and, and we need to, we need to ch uh, change here. And, uh, and these changes are going to happen. I may have taken a more Western perspective. We do have to think of the larger world where many of these technologies today are, are not available and how are we going to transform that world uh, in the future. So, but with that, I would like to thank my my colleagues uh, from the industry and, and academia who are a part of this pr uh, plastics program that we have been running with the help of uh, funding from Mistra. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And we would like to thank you for being the first speaker who was not only on time, but who left a little bit of time for questions. Okay, a warm you. applause for that. <laughs> and I hope that this presentation is recyclable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we say that a conventional fossil-based plastic still has a very strong case? It's cheap, it's practical, and is produced on a large scale. This is where we stand today. And also the fossil industry is pumping in much more money into the production of materials. Yeah. And the other thing we could say that public opinion is today a very strong driving force for change. Mm -hmm. uh, we're banning simple things as plastic, straws, uh, and, and so on. So what, is, what are the engineers doing to rethink new pathways for plastics? I mean, currently, there is a lot of focus on recycling, as I mentioned today, and that recycling is still of the fossil plastics. Yes. And there is, of course, a lot of interest in going renewable, but again, as we talked about the fossil industry, the, the, the economy doesn't work today. Mm -hmm. So unless we have a system where we can put tax on fossil, use of fossil carbon or some policy like that, so if we introduce the concept of circular economy that you touched on, yeah. would, would that, is that the, the, the way ahead? That is the way ahead, yes, indeed. And, and this takes more stakeholders than just the engineers. It, it right. takes some kind of policy making absolutely, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So how could, a, how, how could a scenario look like? Uh, yeah, as I showed you some possibilities today, I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of, actually, a lot, why I think there is hope in this area today is a lot of businesses are involved, and today it is still unclear how it is going to look like. So I feel that there would be a lot of small, uh, well, startups, uh, startups and also other companies which would fill up the gaps between the bigger companies, which are the, which are the main stakeholders, providing technologies for small things, for recycling or uh, collection, for sorting, etc. I was wondering about where the innovation is originating for, from. Could you tell us more? The, the the innovators, the disruptors of the systems, the ones contributing to sustainable solutions, are they coming from other fields? Is it from within the established players? Just uh, to give us an idea. Uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of big companies are involved today also in funding research and funding startups in getting new materials out. And that is a good thing because they are controlling a lot of material flows. And uh, so the I think a lot of innovation comes there. And then you have a n number of companies which are fusing together. Yesterday we heard from Total, they are also working with a biotechnology company to produce a bio-based plastic, mm -hmm. which are they are going to perhaps develop in the coming decade. So uh, there is- Are they material experts? 
experts, production experts. Um, uh, I mean, you have uh, recycling experts, you have uh, biotechnologists, you have chemical engineers. So it is, it is a collaborative from effect. A lot of yes, that's right. I was very happy when you said the future is rather unclear. I think that means that you have an openness for new ideas, say we're not ready to take the final decisions yet, and still we have to act. So it's a, it's a very interesting engineering conflict. We have a problem, don't rush to the solution, but we must solve it sooner or later. Um, uh, yes, <laughs> yes indeed. I took you by surprise, didn't I? <laughs> no, ye yes indeed. Uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, as I said, I, I think, I fear that some of the steps that many countries are taking may be too far. Well, I think it is an urgent urgency here. We need to take yes. action, but we don't, shouldn't take action without getting all the facts. So what, is, what is unclear now? What do we have to find out before we can go rush ahead? We need to see how the entire plastic system, where are the bottlenecks, where are the problems? We need to look at the consumer behavior, look at the plastics that you collected. Do we need new yeah. stakeholders in this process? Um, could Social be. Social scientists? Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, they would be important here, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think we should see if there are questions yeah. from the audience. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, we have the microphone. Would you I use can, it? I can dash down to mm. the audience. Please present yourselves when you ask questions. It's always interesting to hear um, who's asking. And you know the harsh conditions to borrow this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Al Romick from the U.S. National Academy. This may be more suitable with respect to uh, a system than, than recycling plastics, but one of your charts talked about reuse. And what that reminded me of is, as kids, you know, your milk, your soft drink, your beer came in bottles. When you were done, the bottles went back, they were cleaned and then refilled. And it's hard for me to understand today why, with all that's happening, that there hasn't been any resurgence in that. Do you have any idea why? The notion of reusable bottles for a lot of beverages has not returned the way it was decades ago. It seems to make so much sense to me. Uh, the pla you're talking of the plastic bottles or the glass bottles? I was thinking of glass, but there's no reason it wouldn't work with some plastics as well. But I was thinking of the old historical glass example, but plastics would work too. Yeah. The, the milkman coming the to... The milkman, the beer cases, the soft drink cases. Yeah, I, actually, there are cases, I have seen places where they have moved back to glass bottles, but I don't think even that is a sustainable solution. You really need to think of how the plas glass, first thing, how it is made, how it is recycled, no, what are the... You send the bottle back and clean it and refill it. Yeah. So there is no recycling. No, but after certain uses, there would be recycling. There would be... Re yeah. So, re... Uh, the, the average use, when we buy beer that way, the average use of the bottle is only three times. Yeah, that's right. And then you have to heat it up to 1,000 degrees to, uh, to whatever you'd melt the, plus, uh, the glass and then to make it back again. And that's also energy intensive. Uh, so, yes, there are. People are trying to use paper instead of plastic. People are using cotton instead of... How are they produced? I think these are the things uh, we, we need to We have one more about. question. Yes. Um, I'm Axel Meissen from Canada. Thank you for your presentation. The problems that you focused on uh, really revolve around about a dozen types of plastics. The amount of plastics that are produced in large volumes only amount to about a dozen. And those are pl plastics that are quite similar in chemical nature. And I'm really wondering whether we shouldn't look at different kinds of plastics. For example, protein-based plastics, which are completely different. They occur naturally in the shells of animals, in hair, and other kinds of substances. So while I commend the emphasis on the current plastics, I wonder whether we shouldn't look at different categories of plastics as well. Thank you. But, but that is also already pe when people are looking at it already. So it's not, uh, 
I mean, that is also nothing new. Both cellulose plus uh, even proteins are being, being looked at. You, but yeah. in some instances, let's say you have, you have, when you have large volume plastics like polythene, polypropylene and all, one has to look at can you exchange that plastic with a protein? for instance? Will it survive the conditions that are, are needed for, for recycling or whatever you want to uh, Yeah, so it's a, it's a complex, uh, complex system, plastics. It's not just one product that can be just replaced. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a little complex and problematic from that point of view. We have time for one more question from the audience. <laughs> okay, I, I, I'm so hold, up, hold it up closer to your mouth, please. Okay. I'm uh, Sanak Mishra from India. So uh, there are two things I would like to say that uh, I thank the organizer for not putting this uh, paper in a plastic wrapper, which is generally what you find in every conference. So thank you, uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, the, other, the point I was uh, going to make is that why, why should we get hung up on plastic? Why should we not use other materials? Like I come from India, we use cloth bags for many different purposes. Yeah. And I think it's a very uh, environment friendly. We use jute, we use uh, textiles. So why don't we promote the use of these materials uh, simultaneously when we, we seek uh, recyclable plastic or, 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 or biotechnically developed plastics? Why should we not promote the use of alternate materials? Yeah, not, uh, well, not, uh, uh, plastics are beyond also the plastic, just plastics bags. But uh, again, I think uh, you took the example of jute, but a lot of uh, cotton is used in, in India and some countries. And if you look at the production of cotton, it is not entirely environment friendly. And uh, so that is the aspect we forget. Of course, the cotton bag can be used quite, uh, quite a few times. And uh, so I wouldn't say, I wouldn't blame the plastics for all the problems that we have, uh, that we have created today from them. Uh, so of course there are new materials that can be used. Uh, again, how they will come into the system, that is something uh, one needs to uh, really uh, see uh, in the future. But so I think you're pointing to an interesting aspect and that is uh, behavior yeah. uh, and tradition and because plastic has been so cheap, we think it's almost exactly. like, a, like a, a mandatory way of wrapping or... or, or uh, mm. And we need, you said we need behavioral scientists and mm. we need it not only in the consumer-oriented use of plastic, but also in the, in the manufacturing and, and exactly, in business-to-business yeah. business solutions. Yeah. And my last question to you, um, Professor Artika, will be um, if... If you could team up um, the engineering competences with some other um, brilliant competence, uh, what would be needed in order to sort of create a new pathway for plastics uh, or for a, a, or a sustainable material? Let's not use the word plastics. Uh, we, uh, yeah, well... Uh, we need, of course, the natural sci the science, the, the scientists besides the engineers, but we are also working with political scientists and also people who, are, who do the life cycle analysis of the entire value chains to look at where the bottlenecks are. And I think that would be a very important part of which when you make a transformation in a system, are you really improving the environmental profile of your products or are you just shifting the problem from one to the other? And, uh, and this is the same for any kind of system shift. I think what so. You're saying I now. think so. And then, of course, you have to work with the stakeholders, the the raw material producers, and uh, I mean, besides polymers, you also have other additives in the plastics and all. All these people have to have to work together mm. in uh, in that. And, and then you have the business oh, side of it. I love that Go. you said that molecules can be bought as a service. We know software as a service, but yes. molecules, that yes. was a new one for me. Yes, that can uh, be. Roughly the same question about, we talk about creative chaos and circular economy. Can that be, do you think, introduced step by step in the traditional way of reforming? Or do we need a rupture kind of mental revolution to say we have to give up the old system, we have to move into a new way of thinking. 
I think it has to go step by step. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 it's possible also. Uh, yes, I, I believe so. I, I, it has to uh, be taken step by step until uh, also people feel that the, the changes are working and uh, people get, uh, I mean, you ha they have to accept it, accept the change. So and the big question, what will drinking straws look like in five year times? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm not so sure. Maybe we don't need straws anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. joining us on stage. Thank you for joining us as Kites. Thanks. Thank you.